for you to begin. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dina, for helping us get that settled and to our Zoom hosts and to everybody waiting. Again, I just want to apologize and thank you for your patience while we got that figured out. Uh, I am Adrienne Mertens, the Chief Communications and Intergovernmental Relations Officer for the City of Santa Rosa. I want to thank you for taking time to join us this evening. Um, our interpreter services are being provided today in Spanish. Uh, and to start things off, I'm going to have our Zoom host, Trisha, explain how that will work. Servicios de interpretación van a ser proveídos para esta reunión en español. Y nuestro hosped de la reunión nos va a explicar cómo funciona. Live interpretation can be heard on the Spanish channel. You can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Interpretación en vivo puede ser escuchada en el canal de español. Usted puede unirse al canal de español por haciendo un clic en el icono de interpretación en la barra de herramientas que se mira como un globo. Live interpretation will be heard on the Spanish channel. At the time, the public, at the time for public, the interpreter on the panel will be prepared to assist anyone needing interpretation. Additional instruction will be given at that time. Adrian, back to you for additional housekeeping for today's meeting. Thank you. Uh, so this is the information and community input meeting for the City of Santa Rosa's PG&E settlement funds. Uh, this meeting was set up and open to all members of our community. I do want to touch on a few logistical items and then I will introduce you to the rest of our participating staff. So as community members join this virtual meeting, you'll be participating as an attendee. Your microphone is muted and your camera is off. Uh, only today, staff panelists uh, will be viewed during the meeting. Uh, if you're calling in from a telephone for privacy concerns, our host, Trisha, is re renaming your viewable phone number to citizen, and only the last four digits of your phone number will show on the screen to identify you. We will start the meeting with a brief background presentation that will provide information on the settlement funds. And of course, this meeting is also most importantly a time for those of you who have joined us to ask your questions and to provide your input on how you believe the Santa Rosa City Council should prioritize the funds. Uh, and so after the presentation concludes, we'll open for questions and community input. And so for the community input process, I will ask that you raise your hand in Zoom. And at that time, our Zoom hosts will move one by one down the list of attendees with their hands raised. Once you have asked your question or shared your input, the Zoom host will lower your hand. And if you are dialing in from a telephone, you'll want to dial star nine to indicate that you've raised your hand. Uh, so now to introduce our city staff participants, um, our assistant city manager and director of transportation and public works is Jason Nutt. Uh, our interim chief financial officer from our finance department, Alan Alton. Alan will also be giving the presentation an overview of the settlement funds tonight. We have our Director of Housing and Community Services, Dave Gwine. Uh, and then we have from the Fire Department, Chief Tony Gossner, Fire Marshal Scott Moon, and Assistant Fire Marshal Paul Lowenthal. And we also have our interpreters, Pablo and Mario. Thank you so much for being here with us. And then our hosts, who will be helping with the public input and questions, um, Elisa Rawson and Tricia Mason. Uh, they'll also be helping to take notes during the meeting to make sure that we document all of the input received tonight. Um, so in addition to this meeting, the city has held two other public input meetings, one with fire survivors of Coffee Park neighborhood area and the other yesterday evening with fire survivors of the Fountain Grove, Hidden Valley, Montecito and Oakmont neighborhood areas. Um, a digital survey is also being circulated throughout the community to collect public input as well. Uh, that survey will remain open through this Sunday, October 25th. We did extend the date of that um, as well as rescheduled this meeting and the previous one last night um, due to the glass fire. 
Um, and so there is still additional time to take that survey. I'll share the link to it um, at the end of this meeting. And we do encourage you and uh, to take that survey and also share that with other members of the community. Um, so after we've completed the community input process, staff will be taking all of the input that's collected to date, both from the community meetings as well as from this survey and kind of compiling that into a comprehensive report for our city council. Um, they'll be considering that at some upcoming meetings that I will let Alan uh, share that as we transition into his presentation. And so with that, I will turn it over to Alan to begin and we'll give Trisha a moment to transition to his slides. All right, good evening, everyone. I hope you all are well and thank you for uh, joining us this evening to go through uh, this uh, community forum. Uh, let's just dive into the uh, presentation. Um, uh, the next slide, please. So uh, the city filed a claim at the uh, to recoup um, losses from the uh, or damages uh, as a result of the 2017 wildfire. Uh, we filed that claim with PG&E, and this is to go for. Uh, uh, projects um, uh, that were not covered by state uh, or federal aid or insurance. Uh, we received a settlement of $95 million in uh, July of 2020. Uh, next slide, please. The, uh, uh, so the city council uh, upon uh, receiving the money, the city council directed staff uh, to get as much input as possible from the community, both from fire survivors in uh, targeted um, uh, uh, areas uh, that were directly impacted by the fire, but also from the community as a whole, as the fire uh, uh, actually impacted the full community. Um, this, uh, uh, unlike other settlements, uh, the, the funds that we receive in this uh, uh, have no restrictions and can be spent on, uh, on any um, uh, uh, project. Uh, ultimately, the city council will decide uh, of where the funds will be spent. Uh, next slide, please. So a uh, little context before we move forward. Um, the city, uh, after the, the fires in 2017, we started working with uh, FEMA and Cal OES right after that, uh, uh, um, beginning with um, uh, uh, just entry level meetings uh, in the December, January timeframe and, and, and moving all up and we're still actually working with them. In the, it took us probably about two years, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that, to develop the projects to be able to uh, recover from the disaster. Um, uh, this is, uh, is a long process, uh, getting uh, FEMA to uh, understand the projects that, that we uh, need to have done and to ensure that they fit within FEMA guidelines and to um, uh, have them approved by FEMA. All in all, there were 29 projects that were approved by FEMA. Um, uh, uh, all of the projects that would uh, reimburse the city for uh, um, what's called uh, our, well, our response to the, the disaster have been paid uh, so far. So, so we, we've been made whole there. What we have remaining are these, are these um, more uh, uh, recovery projects. So your large construction and other projects, both in, um, for the water department, uh, for parks and for um, public works. Uh, unfortunately, there were some other projects uh, that were denied um, and, uh, and are such uh, unfunded at this point. So next slide, please. So one of those projects uh, um, is Fire Station 5. Uh, it was uh, located at the top of Fountain Grove. Um, it was completely destroyed by the fire. 
uh, we are looking to not only rebuild it, but uh, move it to a more uh, fire defensible space. Uh, we are estimating that the cost uh, to relocate and rebuild the fire station at 14 and a half million, that is a, a net remaining cost. Uh, the city did receive some money from uh, insurance. And so the remaining amount is what we need. Uh, ultimate, it's, it's about a $17 million project all told. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to uh, 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 buildings being destroyed, we also had infrastructure that was damaged. Uh, uh, streets in particular here were damaged mostly during the fire uh, debris removal uh, mission. Uh, we estimate the, the cost to repair and redo these streets uh, at about $24 million. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, uh, in addition to street infrastructure, there were also sidewalk infrastructure that was damaged both by the fire, the intense heat of the fire, but also from the debris removal mission. And we estimate the cost of repairing those sidewalks at about $4.1 million. Next slide, please. And then uh, uh, we also have uh, hazardous tree uh, projects. You know, over the past couple of years since, since the fire, the city has removed hundreds of hazardous street trees and other right-of-way trees in the burn scar area. Um, and there are hundreds uh, remaining in the private property uh, uh, hazardous trees that uh, were identified through an initial um, assessment by the city. So the fire department intends on focusing on these private property dead and drying trees. Um, uh, they uh, present a fall hazard uh, uh, to structures or, or uh, initial structures or neighboring structures. Uh, they do infringe on defensible space around structures and uh, contribute to um, uh, fire fuel. Uh, the cost of that we are estimating at about $5.1 million. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to those specific ones that were outlined, um, and also to be clear on these, these were all, uh, uh, those uh, individual projects were all uh, denied by FEMA. We, we do have, the, the fire station is on appeal, uh, our second appeal with that. So these are some of the reasons why we brought those forward is that they, uh, uh, they realistically look to be an unmet need that funding wouldn't be available for it in the uh, from federal or state areas. We're doing our best to try to get funding for those, but just from a realistic standpoint, um, uh, if other funding sources were there, we, we would bring those forward through that. And there are a number of other projects that have popped up uh, during different community forums, goal setting through uh, uh, in, um, uh, emails and letters to the council. And so we've, we've kind of included uh, uh, a list of these types of projects here. Uh, they are also included on the digital survey that Adrian talked about. Um, there are a number of fire related uh, projects such as vegetation management and uh, evacuation uh, route constructions and improvements. Um, there are uh, home hardening incentives and, and assistant programs uh, for defensible fire spaces, wildfire readiness, uh, um, and things like that. But there are also community-wide uh, uh, projects that have, that have been brought forward, um, such as jumpstarting affordable housing opportunities through incentive funding, um, road repairs that weren't necessarily associated with fire uh, recovery, uh, homeless services, uh, new community assets uh, such as libraries and community centers, um, support for businesses and workforce recovery uh, through loans and grant programs, um, uh, 
strengthening the resiliency of the city's infrastructure uh, through backup generators or microgrids and things like that, and to doing park improvements. Um, again, uh, uh, because of the nature of the funds that went in, uh, uh, we're able to look at a number of community-wide projects. Uh, um, they are, uh, and again, these have just uh, come through uh, uh, different forums along the way. Ultimately, the city council is going to decide uh, where uh, uh, they're going to prioritize the funding. But part of what this forum does and what the other ones in the, sur uh, the survey does is it's providing a, uh, the input to the council uh, of what the community is looking for um, uh, in a way to use this money. Um, so with that, on to the next slide, please. And there, I kind of, kind of uh, 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 got ahead of myself there. But yes, we are looking for this, uh, for your input. This is your opportunity to do that through this meeting. And again, like I said, we have a digital survey that has a number of projects that are on there that allows you to provide that input. Um, at the end of this process, like Adrian said, we're going to uh, close down the survey at the end of uh, uh, Sunday. Uh, then we'll start tabulating all that data, uh, bring together all of the in, uh, input that's come from the forums, uh, that has come to us through emails and letters, and we will develop a report out to the council, first going to the uh, long-term financial uh, policy and audit subcommittee, which is a three-member council or three-council member subcommittee um, that is uh, televised. It's a it's an open meeting. It's a Brown Act published meeting. Um, uh, that will happen on November 12th, and then on November 17th, uh, we will be in front of the full council during a study session to again report out all of this this information. So your input is very important in helping the council prioritize these projects of what would be best for uh, the community. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna wrap up my comments. Thank you, Alan. So we will now open the meeting for questions and your input. And so again, just a reminder, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question via Zoom, please raise your, raise your hand using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. And if you're dialing in via telephone, please use star nine to indicate that you've raised your hand. And Tricia will give you a moment to transition the screen for taking questions and input from our attendees. And I'll let you explain a little bit more about how that will work tonight. Thank you, Adrian. A countdown timer will appear for the convenience of the speaker and viewers. The first speaker will be acknowledged and invited to speak. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Your microphone will be muted at the end of the countdown or at the conclusion of your comment. If you are participating in the meeting from the Spanish channel in Zoom, we have an interpreter on standby on the English channel to assist during your public comment. If you wish to ask a question or provide input, please be sure to pause throughout your comments to allow for interpretation. Those using interpreter support will be afforded additional time for your comments. For Spanish speakers, at the time of at the time you hear your name called, turn off the Spanish channel to make your public comment. This, this icon may now look like a circle with an ES in the middle and the word Spanish underneath. The first speaker will be Thea, followed by Joanna. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Good evening, my name is Thea Hensel. I live on Yalupa Avenue and I am co-chair of the Southeast Greenway campaign. Thanks all for you for listening to the public input tonight. The Southeast Greenway campaign supports fire recovery, housing for all and the creation of a public space that can offer respite for the pressures of life. We come here tonight to thoughtfully consider monies that come to Santa Rosa 
out of pain and suffering. Currently, that includes a housing shortage and safe haven for all. The PG&E windfall is just that, a one-time occurrence to look at opportunities not usually available. Santa Rosa needs affordable housing. Caltrans, who we have been dealing with and owns the Greenway property, will only sell 47 Greenway acres of land if the city purchases the other 10 acres that are zoned for medium density housing. This seems like a win-win situation for the campaign committee and our supporters. The Greenway campaign and Sonoma Land Trust continue to raise money to purchase the parklands portion of this transaction. We ask the city to purchase the remaining land to add to its excess land and housing stock and allow the Greenway project to move forward. Please consider this urgent and timely opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thea. The next speaker will be Joanna. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself. Hi, hello, my name is Joanna Mike, um, and I live off Old Redwood Highway. And I'm calling because I would like the city to invest in fiber uh, to and through the premises for several reasons as a public utility, this will cultivate a vibrant city because everyone will have access to a high quality internet biz and businesses will thrive. It's safe, fast, reliable, private, sustainable, and there would be no digital divide. I've noticed that on the survey, it uh, fiber and wireless have been clumped together. And I think it's very important that the city invests in fiber instead of wireless. Um, I'm also wondering where we can email comments so that the city can take in these comments when they're tabulating um, the public input as the website on Santa Rosa Fire Settlement does not have any information on this. Thank you for your time. And again, um, my suggestion is that the city invests in fiber through and to the premises. Thank you, Joanna. The next speaker is Eddie. Please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Yes, my name is Eddie Alvarez. I'm currently a candidate for city council for district one. And I would like to share my ideas with you all. Uh, we are in agreement that the firehouse should definitely be built. We believe in protecting each other. And that is definitely a big factor when it comes to fire. And uh, a big thank you to our firefighters and uh, for what they do. Uh, I know that we personally have lost uh, our home due to the fires in the recent years. So I commend you and I applaud you for your bravery. With that said, the second thought that I have is that Roseland specifically needs a library. Currently there are concerned citizens which are gathering resources to build this library. And I think there is no better time than now if we can complement their efforts with the funds necessary to finally obtain a library in Roseland. Now, why Roseland, why a library? When we think of the community that was tasked with the cleanup after these fires, a great majority were the laborers from my community, District 1. We were asked to go into these areas that were still smoking with the contaminants in the soils. And we did that. And I think it is just that there's compensation for the community when we think about our future, the children of these workers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, the next speaker is Abigail. Please unmute your mic and state your name for public record. My name is Abigail Zover. I live in Santa Rosa. Thank you very much for having this forum and I appreciate the really well thought out presentation that was given. I, one comment is that the uh, slides on the website don't have the long list. There's a few missing. Uh, but one of the things I can't help but notice is that if you add up all of the existing um, expenses that were presented, that's 
around 47, 50, 48 million dollars and leaving around $47 million left over. So I, it doesn't sound like there's really enough money to go around for everything. And all of these are very worthy goals. I want affordable housing. I want a library in Roseland. I want fiber for all parts of Santa Rosa. I, I want those, but if we do not address the fire risk that's looming over our heads, then all of those wonderful goals will get burned in the next fire. And therefore vegetation management, control burns, some removal of vegetation, whatever it might be, there are many wonderful, very talented fire ecologists in the state of California that could give us very good advice on what we should do with Spring Lake, with Annandale, with the area of and beyond Rincon Valley, with Mont Montecito Heights, with the vegetation on the west side of town, all of these are looming over our heads like the sword of Damocles. And they just have to take first priority. I think what we've seen year after year since the Tubbs fire is that every fall we are going to face life-threatening fires. And if we don't take action to deal with that problem, everything that we take, everything we value is at risk, including all these wonderful things that people have put forward. Thank you. Hey, um, before we go to the next question, could I just answer a couple questions or make comment on a couple things that came up the last couple of speakers? Um, there was a question about um, how to email comments to city council because it wasn't on the website. Um, so you can email directly to city council any comments you want to. That's citycouncil at srcity.org. That's that email address. But I uh, do want to reiterate. Um, what we mentioned earlier that all of the input from these meetings that we are documenting, um, as well as the responses to the survey where there are open-ended response uh, fields as well. Um, and any emails that are coming into the city and to council are all going to end up getting compiled together into the same report. So um, depending, you know, it doesn't matter where you wanna submit your comments to, but we will uh, compile all of them into the same report that they receive for consideration. Um, and then also um, on the last comment uh, about the slides on the website, not having that same list that was in Alan's presentation. So if you, when you actually go to take the survey, that full list is there and um, survey responders actually weigh in on each of those areas um, to indicate how strongly um, they feel that those, the funds should be prioritized for each of those areas. Thank you, Adrian. The next speaker is Magdalena and then Janine. So I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic and state your name for public record. Hi, my name is Magdalena McCullough and I'm giving a comment today because there's obviously so many things we could be doing with this money and I don't know how we make ourselves whole after 2017 and everything that happened or how we ever make um, the eastern part of our city fire safe. I don't know the answers to those questions, but to the extent that we are doing additional community projects that aren't related to fire safety, I must advocate for a library in Roseland, especially because Southwest Santa Rosa is already a very dense area and it's becoming even more dense as people are doing infill and affordable housing is being built. And these circumstances have only been exacerbated by losing so much of our housing stock in the fire and all of the changes that have happened since. Um, it's also, you know, you can never say it's it's completely fire safe, but it's one of the safer areas in our city. And I personally anticipate that more and more people are gonna be moving to Southwest Santa Rosa and we need more resources over there. We still don't have a library. It's been at least 15 years since community members have been actively asking for one. And there's a project right in the center of our neighborhood that is being built that is supposed to have a library in it um, that also includes over 150 housing units. So it seems like it could also be a way to um, promote a little bit more of that project being built and having that housing security that we 
lost so tragically in 2017. So um, again, if, if there was some way to direct all the money to just making our city completely safe, um, you know, those are decisions that you guys should probably make, but I don't know that that's the situation. So if we are using the funds for community purposes, I really think it, it's, it's a great project to invest in that would benefit our recovery from this tragedy. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Janine, followed by Miranda. Janine, please unmute your mic and identify yourself for public record. Hello, I'm Janine. I am a 2017 fire survivor and was unable to attend the community meeting. So thank you for doing this again. I have a brief comment, but a couple of questions. I certainly feel that all of the funds that are coming to the community for um, the reason of fire um, safety should be used for that. And we should be looking at those projects first. So my questions are for the fire station, does that dollar amount, the cost that you showed on the slide include what you would do with the current location where the fire station was? From what I'm understanding, you're gonna be moving the fire station. So does that include doing something with that land? And then also do your dollar amounts in these slides include a timeline? So if we have extra funds, can we expedite having um, some of these projects completed by having more um, dollars to throw at it so that we can um, get out of the situation that we've been in for the past three years of having um, poor infrastructure and um, need for vegetation. Um, Tony or Jason, do one of you wanna to speak to the fire station? I can speak to the fire station. The, the, the property that the initial fire station is on is uh, the city property. Uh, there are no plans for it that I'm aware of. Maybe Jason has uh, information on that. Uh, <clears throat> and the timeline, we're looking at uh, three years to, to complete the project for the fire station at this point. Yeah, I concur with Tony. Um, it is uh, still about a three-year project. There are no plans for the ex for the original station location, uh, except to keep it um, or to remove any additional facilities that were associated with the original station as we uh, look to rebuild it in another location that's that's less fire prone. So I guess I would just add that I would appreciate a plan to maybe either. Uh, look at that lot to either sell it for a home or perhaps look at it to remove the parking lot and ensure that there aren't people parked there that shouldn't be. But my other question on timeline was more generally for all of the slides that you showed, what, what is the timeline to complete those projects? Uh, so let me respond to the question about that property. It's actually the same piece of property that the tank is on. It is not segregated uh, and not a separate component. So selling off uh, is not necessarily one of the aspects the city's looking at at this point in time. Um, when it comes to protection of the property itself at Newgate Court, uh, we'll certainly be removing any um, attractive nuisance that exists on that property. We, we don't wanna create something there that, that uh, wasn't there previously. So uh, those are things that we'll be working on. Uh, when it comes to the fire recovery projects, we're actively working on a majority of the projects from 2017. Uh, we expect to see most of those completed within the next 12 months. Um, things that uh, were listed in Alan's presentation, uh, those, are, those are all uh, dependent upon the uh, funding availability. If funding is made available, we will be able to insert those into the capital improvement program for the upcoming year. Um, with that said, uh, some of those require design and design will generally take a period of time before we actually get into breaking ground. Hopefully that answers your, the additional question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, now Miranda is next to speak followed by Patricia. Miranda, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hello, my name is Miranda. Um, 
if you could speak up, you're very faint. Yeah, totally. Um, I'll just lower the volume. Okay. Um, my name is Miranda. I want to encourage you all to prioritize as your number one consideration affordable housing. We have $47 million to work with, and it's plenty to kickstart concrete efforts to prevent homelessness. It's time for community land trusts, rental assistance, rent control. Now more than ever, it's time to crack down on unscrupulous landlords who think that a microwave constitutes a kitchen. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Patricia, please unmute your microphone and say your name for public record. Um, Patricia, you're still on mute. She's still on mute. Oh, here we go. Patricia? Unfortunately, I can't hear you. Oh, I hear something. Bueno. Okay. Si me escuchan? Pablo. Can you hear me? Si me escuchan ahorita? Si la escuchamos, señora. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, no sé si me escuchan. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Ya los escucho yo. Well, I can hear you guys. Okay. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Patricia Moreno y vivo en la ciudad de Santa Rosa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patricia Moreno, and I live in the city of Santa Rosa. Y soy miembro del proyecto organizativo del norte de la bahía, y hoy estoy aquí para abogar por los residentes más vulnerables de nuestra ciudad. Um, and I'm here currently to uh, advocate for the members of our, our county that are most vulnerable. Y esto incluye a nuestros hermanas y hermanos que son indocumentados. Uh, and this includes our brothers and sisters that are undocumented. Eh, nuestros hermanos y hermanas indocumentados han estado históricamente eh, y sistemáticamente marginalizados. Um, our brothers and sisters that are undocumented have been historically and systematically uh, segregated. Y hoy estoy aquí para decirles que ustedes tienen, o oh, con este dinero hay la oportunidad de ayudar a, a, a la, nuestra comunidad más vulnerable. Um, and I'm here to say that with this money, um, you actually have the ability to help the most vulnerable people in our community. Invirtiendo en, o poniendo dinero para asistencia para renta. Um, investing or placing money for rent assistance. Que con la pandemia, el, digamos que la cuota que hay que pagar va a ser enorme para las, nuestros trabajadores eh, esenciales. Um, which with, we can say with the pandemic, um, the amount that's going to have to be paid by these essential workers is going to be tremendous. Pero también podemos ir a la raíz del problema invirtiendo en fideicomisos para adquirir tierras y construir vivienda bajo costo. Uh, but also we can just attack the root of the problem and acquire land trust to start uh, building homes. Entonces, eh, tenemos la oportunidad de hacer las cosas bien antes de que esto empeore y tengamos más gente viviendo en las calles. Um, so this is the opportunity to really make things better um, before it's, we have more people living in the streets. Gracias y que tengan buena tarde. Uh, thank you and have a good afternoon or evening. Thank you. The next speaker is Lauren, followed by Ramka. Lauren, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hi, my name is Lauren Fury and I live on Summerfield Road. Um, I'll be pausing for the interpreter. Uh, I would like to advocate for Santa Rosa to use $10 million of the PG&E settlement funds to match Sonoma County's investment in the Renewal Enterprise District Affordable Housing Fund. The loss of housing is one of the most significant impacts from the 2017 fires. Uh, we were already in a housing crisis when the Tubbs fire happened and subsequent fires have only worsened the situation. 
We desperately need new housing and housing that's affordable to all of our residents. By committing a matching amount of $10 million to the Red Affordable Housing Fund, Santa Rosa will have access to a $20 million seed fund to help get affordable housing projects across the financing finish line. This fund can be set up as a loan program that is self-sustaining so that it supports long-term housing opportunities for Santa Rosans. Most state and federal sources of funding reward projects that have local government financial commitments in place. As a Bay Area County, we compete head to head with projects located in towns and cities that have access to much larger sources of affordable housing funding. By creating our own affordable housing seed fund, Santa Rosa developments will be more competitive for funding sources at the state and federal level, which typically fund almost 70 to 90% of the typical affordable housing development cost. And finally, uh, aside from affordable housing, I wanna say that I concur with the other community members calling for vegetation management throughout uh, wild urban interface areas of Santa Rosa. Without strong proactive fuel load management, prescriptive burning and other measures, all of these investments in infrastructure, housing, libraries, and so on will be for naught. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. The next speaker is Rumka followed by Robert. Rumka, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hi, my name is Rumka Singh and I live in Skyhawk. I used to live in Fountain Grove and I lost my house there and now the fire came to Skyhawk. I'm very grateful for the efforts of the firefighters and because of their efforts today, my house is standing. Um, I want to advocate for fire prevention. I think the fires, whether you live in a high risk fire area or a low risk fire area, they affect our entire community as evidenced by the unfortunate house destruction in Coffee Park in the 2017 fires, the fire can affect each and every part of Santa Rosa. And when the fires come, you know, there is loss of housing and everybody, the richest resident to the poorest resident is affected and the poorer residents are affected even more. Um, and so I think, you know, for the entire community, our efforts should be focused for fire prevention and firefighting. And that is my request. Thank you so much. Thank you. Robert, please unmute yourself and identify yourself um, for public record. Hello, I am uh, Bob Geyser. I live on Fremont Drive in Santa Rosa, and I am co-chair of the Southeast Greenway Campaign Committee. At this time, the city of Santa Rosa has the opportunity to not only address some of the current pressing fiscal needs, but to look forward and create long-term benefits for the whole community. Our group has worked with the city, the Sonoma Land Trust, and other partner, partner agencies to acquire 57 acres of unused land so that together we can create a large community asset with multiple uses and long-term benefits. The land use plan for the Southeast Greenway that was adopted by the city last year shows 47 acres of public park. The 29 acres from Montgomery High School to Summerfield Road will become a city park and the 18 acres east of Summerfield will become an extension of Spring Lake Park. Today, we are asking for $12 million of funding for the city to buy the other 9.7 acres of the Greenway property. This is the three sites near Farmers Lane and Yulupa Avenue that are planned for up to 244 housing units in medium and medium high density. City acquisition of this land from Caltrans will allow the acquisition of the parkland to proceed. 
will provide much needed new housing to the community, will give the city more direct control of the development of these sites, and will increase the coordination in the design of the public parks and private development in the Greenway. The amount of our request is based on a preliminary estimate of by city staff of 12 to 14 million for the sales price of the developable parcels. After the final appraisals and negotiations take place, that price tag may be reduced. If so, we request that any unused balance of the requested $12 million be placed in a Southeast Greenway account and set aside for park development. This will allow seed money to acquire matching grant funds and provide a fundraising platform. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Robert. Jennifer will be the next speaker followed by Sarah. Jennifer, please unmute your mic and identify yourself for public record. Hi, my name is Jennifer Laporta. I live uh, at Roseland area. And um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, okay, so in terms of your survey, it was co very confusing because you lumped wireless in with fiber to the premises. So I'm, I'm, I want to know if you're going to decipher which of those two people want if they check that box. And I'm also wondering if you'll tell the public how many emails were received for each individual topic. And um, I, my vote is for fiber to the premises and through the premises. Fiber is the wired alternative to being sprayed with wireless radiation 24 seven from the cell phone towers all over town. Fiber is safer, faster, more reliable, more cyber secure, more private and uses less energy than cell phone towers. Many cities have installed fiber to the premises such as Chattanooga, Tennessee. And guess what? They reaped a 1000% return on their investment. Fiber can be regulated by cities at regular and low income rates as opposed to what we have now, which is ever increasing rates from big telecommunications, big telecom. And thus we could eliminate the digital divide if we had the city regulating fiber at regular and low income rates. Businesses left Knoxville, Tennessee for Chattanooga when fiber was installed in Chattanooga. How home, price, price, home prices rose in Chattanooga. Why would Santa Rosa give big telecom lucrative long-term contracts when the city could regulate fiber? Uh, I want to thank council members Fleming, Rogers, and Tibbetts for voicing support for this in the goal setting meeting on August 3rd and 4th. There were a total of 78 comments asking for a protective telecommunication ordinance and fiber to the premises. These 78 comments were out of a total of 99 comments for all the issues on that night. That sounds to me like an overwhelming majority of comments for people who want to see fiber installed, fiber optic. So I also want to say that Santa Rosa needs a telecommunications ordinance that protects residents, schools, and daycares from wireless transmission facilities. And I understand that ordinance is on the way, but this is, this is the big picture. You need to install fiber. Every time you dig a conduit, let's do a dig once policy where you install the fiber while those those roadways, those, those, uh, those, those areas are open for other construction purposes. And I believe my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll take a, just a quick, uh, quick sec to address a couple of the questions that were in there. Um, so on the survey, those are very broad themes. They're not the plan for what would be implemented. Um, it's really uh, to get a sense on the areas in which our community would like to see the settlement funds be invested. There will have to be much further discussions and planning around each of those areas. Um, and then for the compilation of emails with the survey data. Um, I don't know that we've completely figured out how we'll do that yet. Um, we, we do have a few thousand survey responses already and uh, um, there's open-ended responses on that as well. But 
we'll make sure um, that it is complete um, and that it does you know, accurately reflect the views that those that took the time to respond. Um, and that report will be made available um, on that same website where you can access the survey, uh, which I'll cover at the end of this meeting too, um, so that the public can view it as well. And that'll be posted uh, by November 12th. Thank you, Adrian. So the next speaker will be Sarah, followed by Joanna. Sarah, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for a public record. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Sarah Kasmuth. I use they, them pronouns. And I am the interim board president of the North Bay Organizing Project. Uh, that's the same organization that our friend Patricia identified herself as part of earlier that didn't actually come through on the English. So I just wanted to add that in. I would like very much to talk about housing, uh, but I have to pause here and address just something that I, I, I noticed this evening that bothers me just a heck of a lot. Um, after spending about 20 minutes figuring out the interpretation for tonight, residents on this meeting relying on that interpretation had nothing. Uh, the speaker carried on and, and, you know, occasionally we could hear something happening, um, but it didn't happen until well into the meeting, uh, into the presentation. Uh, this really demonstrates to our Spanish speaking community just how little Santa Rosa cares about them and that, that it's just a huge insult to our neighbors and I'm embarrassed to have witnessed something like that tonight in a, in a city that's about 28.6 Latinx. Um, and y'all said that the community's input is important, and I want to know whose input is important. Um, the Board of Supervisors ran a survey as well. Um, they only received 29 Spanish responses out of the 1,600. And those responses show vastly different priorities than us English speakers. The top priorities among English speakers for that survey in order were vegetation management, alert and warning systems, road repair, affordable housing, and community preparedness. The top priorities for Spanish speakers were financial assistance, so rent control, or not rent control, rental assistance, things like that, affordable housing, broadband internet, community preparedness, and alert and warning systems. So we are, if you will, speaking different languages. And in a county stuck in the lowest tier in COVID recovery, um, you know, in large part because of our racial disparities, this is a major issue. And we are also speaking different languages when we talk about things like affordable housing. Those two words together don't always mean the same thing. Uh, we do not support the Red Fund. Transit-oriented housing tends to be a major factor in gentrification. Uh, we call for a community land trust in particular. I want to advocate most specifically for common space community land trust. We are you know, working with them uh, to actively serve marginalized communities and any amount of seed money that goes toward that organization is funding well spent. Uh, that will help build the infrastructure of that organization and allow it to provide housing uh, for generations. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just make a comment real quick. Uh, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we did experience at the beginning with the interpreter app. Um, that was obviously unexpected. Um, and if there is anything that I need to follow up on with those that missed the first part of the meeting, um, following this meeting in the next few days, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I will provide my contact information at the end of this meeting so that um, the, that can happen. Thank you, Adrian. The next speaker is Joanna, followed by Kimberly. Joanna, please unmute your mic and identify yourself for the public record. Hello, my name is Joanna Mike, and I just want to say thank you guys for taking the time to answer our questions throughout this process and being interactive because I know a lot of us have had um, a lot of question marks and it just makes it so much easier when we can speak to you guys in this manner. Um, I just want to reiterate what another community member had mentioned that 
I think it's really important that when you guys do come up with the tally of who emailed or how many emails you guys got about each thing that you guys make that very transparent to the public. Um, just because, you know, we are residents of Santa Rosa and we do want to know what the public was saying. Um, in addition, as I've mentioned before, I am in support of fiber to the premises and not for wireless. And I think the city council should be aware that um, it was wireless transmission facilities that helped cause the Malibu Canyon fires a few years ago. And, you know, Santa Rosa has had four years of devastating fires. And I think that this um, investment into broadband or into, excuse me, into fiber optics is also trying to help with fire damage in the future while minimizing the digital divide. Um, and again, thank you guys for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Thank you. Kimberly is next is next to speak and then followed by Roman. Kimberly, please unmute your mic and identify yourself for public record. Hi, my name is Kimberly Stevenson and I live on Matson Place. I support the city utilizing $47.7 million to complete projects remaining from the 2017 wildfires. Additionally, the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors has voted to approve $10 million of affordable housing funding for the Renewal Enterprise District Junior. out of the County pg e Settlement Funds. I encourage the City of Santa Rosa to match these funds to address the city's urgent need for affordable housing. This combined $20 million will seed the Renewal Enterprise District Housing Fund and allow for a revolving loan fund that works to bridge the financing gaps for housing construction. I would also be very interested in seeing what the city staff would propose with regard to the remaining funds and how they would be utilized best to meet the various competing community priorities that, um, that would show us how we could best leverage dollars to accomplish the most goals. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Roman followed by Colin is next to speak. Roman, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hi, my name is uh, Roman. I am a fire survivor. I lost everything in the 2017 fire. Um, so this pain is not lost on me, uh, but we've adapted. This was three years ago. All of us who suffered have adapted and we're going through another multitude of crises. Uh, we have a cr housing crisis, an employment crisis, um, an economic crisis, eviction crisis. Uh, we have a suicide crisis. Our mental health facilities are completely full to the point people are being released after suicide attempts. Uh, I don't want to be insensitive, but these projects um, around trees on private property, uh, if you own acreage, take care of it. There are so many resources circulating around land stewardship, um, broadband. I, this is kind of a hot topic, but we can barely, we can barely afford shelter. Um, road repairs not associated with fire recovery. I don't even know why that's there. Um, in regards to the housing crisis, um, between 2015 and 2019, there were 150 building permit issuances that went towards housing, those with an income ranging from like extremely low to very low to low. In that same time frame, 1,500 building permits were issued for above moderate income. This place is like a Marin wannabe, except we, the problem is we need the lower class to function as a county relying on tourism wine and ag, um, so they need us. So we have this deficit of 3000 issuances of permits under state RHNA standards. So I just don't understand what that is. I'm also kind of weirded out um, by the makeup of this committee. Um, we have an assistant city manager, housing community services head and three fire department heads. Um, and these are one-time funds that are up in the air uh, 
around finance, it, just, it seems like an odd makeup for a listening session because these issues are ranging from broadband to potholes. It's like, it's all over the place. So I think, I mean, I, I'm not talking, I, I'm not talking shit about any of you, but it, it's just weird. Um, so I wanna echo Patricia's comments. Uh, Eddie Alvarez, uh, I love you, Eddie. Uh, give him a library. <laughs> Jesus, how is that even a thing? This is the same district devastated by COVID. It's like people don't care about them. Uh, so to rein this in, we need affordable housing. We need rent assistance toward our lower class, especially the undocumented, who literally are this county's backbone living in close quarters because they simply can't afford this area, but we rely on them so heavily for our wine tourism industry. Um, I appreciate everything the fire department does. All three of you here, I love you, you're heroes. Um, th anyways, thank you. So just a quick comment uh, and Apologies if that wasn't explained better at the beginning. Our panelists are here in the event we do get questions. Um, it is difficult to, to always guess all of the types of questions we might get on these meetings, but given the range of themes that were um, in that slide and that have come up in previous meetings, um, this is uh, who we came up with for our panel. Our assistant city manager that's on is also our director of public works and has largely been responsible for the infrastructure side of our recovery and managing that. Um, we also have our housing representative on um, as well as our fire department as noted. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Colin followed by Erica. Colin, please unmute yourself and identify yourself for public record. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My name is Colin Metcalf. Uh, I've been a lifetime resident of Sonoma County and of Santa Rosa. Um, I wanna echo uh, points made by Eddie Alvarez and Patricia and Roman and Miranda, um, not in any particular order. Uh, I agree with Ramon that uh, we should be focusing primarily on working class folks uh, with Patricia, that we should be focusing on undocumented, uh, our undocumented neighbors and community members. Um, these fires have driven dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of people out of their homes and residences, uh, people who have been driven out onto the street uh, and who will then be summarily be abused by the Santa Rosa Police Department and the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. Um, I have been present at a number of encampment clearings and I cannot tell you the number of people who talk to me about how they used to have a fine living arrangement and they were doing okay and then they were driven out by the fires in 2017 or they were driven out by fires in any other time. And the fact that we have allowed our community members, our neighbors, our family, our friends to languish on the streets while we're talking about $4 million to repair sidewalks, $5 million to remove trees on private property, we should not be using publicly gifted funds. Money that we got from a settlement from PG&E to work in our communities to make sure that the damage from these fires is not widespread, I don't see why we're going onto private properties and removing these trees. That's $5 million right there. That could be used for plenty of other things. Um, I did not know about this library idea in Roseland. I think it's a great idea. I wanna back up Eddie Alvarez and Matt and other community members who have discussed the library. Um, I think it's great. Give them a library, you know, they deserve it. Uh, we also need to be focusing on the working class. Uh, without the working class, Sonoma County would be nothing. Tourism, uh, the wine industry, all of these things are propped up by hardworking individuals uh, who often barely have enough to pay rent in this county, much less eat and survive and have a decent standard of living. Um, we need to support them. We need to give people rental assistance. Uh, we need to work on affordable housing structures. If, if there is something that we could do maybe in conjunction with projects Room Key and Home Key, uh, maybe picking up abandoned structures and moving people into them and just saying like, this is owned by the city, like, We'll figure it out. We're gonna give you somewhere to live in the meantime to get you back on your feet because right now you're, you're houseless, you're out on the street maybe, and we need to support folks who are doing stuff, uh, members of our community. Um, I'd also like to recognize, this is unrelated, 
to the fire relief. Um, today is the seventh anniversary of Andy Lopez's killing by the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department, Deputy Eric Gellhouse, and I just want to recognize his life and suggest that others do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do need to take a quick recess to allow our interpreters to switch roles. So we're gonna pause for a few minutes and hopefully we can complete this um, smoothly. So we will be on pause for just a few minutes. Interpreter Pablo, can you please turn your camera on and give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Perfect, thank you. Interpreter Mario, can you please test your mic and confirm you can hear me and I can hear you? Hello. Perfect. Thank you. Adrian, we have switched interpreter roles. So if you want to have everyone rejoin, we can restart the meeting. Great, sounds good, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and continue. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Erica as the next speaker, followed by Helena. Erica, if you can please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. My name is Erica. I live in the city of Santa Rosa. I am not a part of any big group or coalition advocating for fire funds to be spent. Um, me and my family lost our house in the Tubbs fire along with all of our belongings. Our neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods have yet to um, be given replacement street signs after three years, street lights, landscaping. Our parks are still um, burnt up from the fires. And I would really strongly urge the city of Santa Rosa to consider only using the funds received because of the Tubbs fire to repair these infrastructures, street lights, landscaping parks that have been destroyed due to the Tubbs fire. Also the money should be spent on fire mitigation. 
if we spend this money to build low income housing with no fire mitigation, like the previous speaker said, everything is just gonna burn down. The city should take these funds and put the money to repair what was destroyed in the Tubbs fire. First, if there's any monies left over, then they should be spent on affordable housing, libraries, new parks. But before the city even considers building all this additional infrastructure, buildings, parks, I think the focus should be on repairing what was damaged first. And I'm just curious as to why new parks are wanting to be built with this money, but the existing parks are still burnt and destroyed. I guess that would be a question that in my mind doesn't make sense. And things like the potholes in the roads are directly related to the fires due to the fact that big trucks have been coming into the neighborhoods on roads, bringing in trusses and cement trucks, which have damaged the roads to repair the neighborhoods, which is directly related to the 2017 Tubbs fire. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. The next speaker is Helena, followed by Noah. Elena, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hello, my name is Helena Whistler and I'm a member of the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation Board. The Foundation Board has been raising money for the library system for over 30 years. We support the newest branch of the library in Roseland. We advocate for a permanent branch there, and we encourage you to invest in this endeavor with funding from the pg e settlement. The reason our volunteer board fundraises for the library system is because the library is a priceless resource to the growing population of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. It has proven to be a critical part of our community. For example, thousands of children, teens, and adults participate in the library summer reading program across all branches every year. Every age group saw a double digit increase in participation from the previous year, showing that the library is becoming more crucial, not less. Author Frank Chimero says, I once heard that a library is one of the few remaining places that cares more about you than your wallet. It means that a person can be a person there, not a customer, not a user, not an economic agent, not a pair of eyes to monetize, but a citizen and community member, a reader and a thinker, a mind and a soul. As we consider that many spaces open to the public require some form of buy-in, such as purchasing food, our free spaces like libraries and parks become that much more important, especially for children and teens in low-income areas. If you read the, first, the recent First Five report on school readiness, you saw that the research clearly found a correlation in Sonoma County with visiting the library once a week and school readiness in children. Currently over 500 children are registered Roseland Library users and the site of the new temporary library is a half a mile away from Cook Middle School. Without the Roseland Library, those children would be without a community library. Libraries are critical to their early and ongoing education. Computer centers, library materials and reference librarians are also a priceless asset to a community's adults. The library offers countless resources for entertainment, workforce development, and education. A permanent library opens the doors of opportunity and helps a, to build a vibrant community. As the city of Santa Rosa considers investing in the people and community of Roseland by using at least a hundred, uh, sorry, at least one million dollars of the pg e settlement funds for the permanent Roseland library. The Sonoma County Public Library Foundation continues to support that plan. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Next we have Noah and followed by John. Noah, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Do I need to speak up? Um, you sound good. Thank you. My name is Noah. I want to name the issues that this pro in this process that need to be addressed first and foremost. This meeting was delayed and should be extended to allow Spanish speaking participants more time as compensation for lack of interpretation. And I'll be pausing to allow interpreter, ti interpreter times. The city could and should have addressed this ahead of time. The city and county's method of gathering input has been discriminatory from the initial survey sent out that had an overwhelmingly only English language response. The initial county survey and its priorities only had 29% or only had 29 Spanish responses, 1.8% of the total response, which is a reflection of how the county had mismanaged getting the word out to our Spanish speaking residents. And I want to name that there was little to no option for indigenous language speakers. The overwhelmingly white county survey response has skewed these priorities. The Spanish language responses named financial assistance i.e. rental assistance and affordable housing as the top two priorities that this fund, these funds should be used for. The fires destroyed 5% of the city's housing stock, especially impacting black indigenous people of color and tenants in this county who have since been scattered with few affordable options. In the wake of that destruction, developers now get to hand pick lots in low income areas for expensive new housing that will line their own pockets at the expense of a community under crisis-driven displacement. Projects like the redlining district claim a progressive philosophy, but in practice prioritize developers and speculators, which are historically racist and predatory. Tenants continue to be charged exorbitant rent with a threat of an eviction wave breathing down their necks. And those who are already unsheltered are maligned by city government and the press Democrat just today are continuously brutalized by an overflowingly, overflowing with cash police force. All of these are manifestations of disaster capitalism where corporate interests and militarized law enforcement use climate disasters to secure their own power at the expense of Santa Rosa's working class. We need rental assistance. We need a library in Roseland. We need a community controlled affordable housing uh, priority that prioritizes black indigenous people of color, community uh, such as the Common Space Community Land Trust. These land trusts permanently secure equitable and affordable shelter away from the speculative market, a market born from racist origins and ensure that the land remains affordable in perpetuity. I recognize and uplift Tierra y Libertad land and freedom for Santa Rosa's working class and marginalized residents. Thank you. John is the next speaker. John, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself for public record. Hi, good evening. My name is John McCall and I work for the Sonoma Land Trust. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, associating myself with comments from a couple of the previous speakers from the Southeast Greenway campaign, we wrote a letter to the city on October 2nd detailing how uh, $12 million of these settlement funds um, could go to support the Southeast Greenway project. Uh, this money, it, we, I, there's so much tonight um, that is about the need to repair and recover and we also need to look forward. So many needs of the city in the future are related to housing, are related to open space and resources for all of our communities. So I appreciate all the other speakers bringing forward issues that I'm learning about as well. Um, the Greenway, uh, the first speaker, Thea Hensel, talked a lot about the benefits, but I just wanna quickly hit on them. The housing component is 244 units uh, near Farmer's Lane, three, three parts of the Greenway are related to housing. And then right through the center and heart of our city is the Greenway, the park and open space area. We as the land trust working with a lot of partners have raised over $2 million to help 
purchase and protect the open space. And these settlement funds would give the city the resources we need to focus on the whole property, including the development, the housing pieces, uh, the mixed use pieces. So uh, we appreciate all the, the challenges and needs the city's facing. We hope you come out with a, a balanced proposal in the end for this funding that includes money for the Greenway. Thank you for your time. Thank you. At this time, I do not see any other hands raised. I just wanted to take a moment to touch on a couple of the comments that were made earlier on. Uh, as Adrian had mentioned, we did receive a number of uh, questions in the last couple of community meetings that were very specific to vegetation management, dead and dying trees, uh, and other effects from the fire. Uh, the fire department is actively looking into uh, the volume of dead and collapsing and deteriorating trees uh, in the footprint of the Tubbs fire and Nunn's fire. Uh, when the um, dollar amount was figured, it was looked at at the volume of trees that presented different types of risks. Right now, the fire department is focusing on adjusting our weed abatement ordinance, uh, which is a currently a seasonal program that allows us to go in and ensure that uh, seasonal grasses within our wildland, or primarily in our wildland urban interface, the hillside communities are abated and it gives us a process to enforce that to make sure that that area is as fire safe as we can make it with that particular program. Our goal is to include trees into that ordinance, which will allow us to require property owners to take action on specific trees uh, that pose a threat to public safety from a fall hazard onto streets or onto a neighbor's neighboring property or other structure uh, within the footprint. Uh, the method at which we would uh, be able to uh, force that removal uh, is where something like some of the dollar amounts from this um, settlement could be used potentially to help with that program. These are all the different types of concepts that we're looking at. Um, vegetation management uh, was another hot topic. Um, the fire department and the city of Santa Rosa have actively pursued a number of grants to kickstart a program to help make our, our community safer from the threat of wildfires uh, as we move into the future. Uh, the plan that we have developed is called a community wildfire protection plan. Uh, that plan was funded by the only successful grant that we've had since 2017. In order to actually effectively help prevent the threat of wildfires here locally, it will take money. Uh, even as we're having these community meetings and have been unsuccessful in past grant applications, we do and have already submitted additional grant applications uh, as we move into the future. So uh, we have had a lot of questions about how that would work. Um, we are hopeful that we will uh, be able to kickstart something in your future uh, that will help obviously th um, lay out the foundation for helping protect a lot of the assets and values that we have within our community from the threat of wildfire as we move forward. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so without any more questions or, or excuse me, any more hands raised, um, we have reached the end of the meeting. Um, I do wanna thank you all for participating this evening. Um, and if you did not provide any input tonight, you can still do so by taking the online survey um, by no later than October 25th. And we've got the link to that survey now on the screen. It's srcity.org forward slash 2017 fire settlement. Um, and on that site, we'll also be posting updates and the final community input report. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that report will be posted by November 12th. And the recording of this meeting will also be posted on the site in the next 24 hours. Um, you know, next steps. Uh, once the survey closes after Sunday, we will be compiling all this input together to get that report ready. Um, and then that report will be delivered to our city council for consideration at those two upcoming meetings that Alan mentioned earlier, the long-term financial policy and audit council subcommittee meeting on November 12th and at the regular council meeting on November 17th. And we'll have details and links to how to participate in both of those public meetings posted to that 2017 fire settlement webpage once we get a little closer to those meeting dates. 
Um, and so with that, I will, oh, I'm sorry. I also uh, wanted to provide my contact information. Um, I was trying to have our Zoom hosts make a quick slide to put that up on the screen. I don't know if they were able to. Yes, we uh, have, give us just a moment to put that up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, if anybody had any difficulties with hearing the first part of the presentation tonight um, and wants uh, the city to follow up with them, uh, we are happy to do that. Again, we apologize. Um, that was unexpected, but there is my phone number and my email address and uh, we can figure out uh, how to meet your needs. Um, with that, uh, if we could just leave that screen up there for a few minutes, but we are concluding for the evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Adrian.